In the previous video, we discussed these two sesamoid bones that are present just proximal to the first MTP joint in each foot. And you can see, based on the color coding, that every single person has these two sesamoids in each foot. But then you can see, based on the other colors here, that there's varying degrees of prevalence of each of these accessory bones or sesamoids. And there's two in particular that we're going to be covering in this and the next video, and those are the os trigonum and down here the os peroneum, because they're a little bit more common and there are clinical conditions associated with dysfunction of both of these little bones. So in this video, we're going to be discussing the os trigonum. So the os trigonum is an ossicle that develops embryologically from the talus. Now, the Taylor body and the posterior Taylor process, these are going to develop from separate ossification centers. So between the 7th and 13th year of life, the posterior Taylor process appears as a separate ossicle, the os trigonum. And then what's supposed to happen, normally within a year of its appearance, it fuses with the talus. So this occurs around the time of adolescence. But in some individuals, an estimated 10 to 26 percent, so fairly decent number of people on the planet, that fusion does not occur. And so the os trigonum is going to be seen on an x-ray as an individual bone, or in some cases it can actually be two or more pieces, but more commonly it's just one individual bone. And you can see that bone would exist right here, right behind the talus, and then superior to the calcaneus. This is a very small ossicle. It's less than one centimeter in diameter, and it's also worth noting that the tendon of flexor hallucis longus is situated medial to the os trigonum. So right here you see the os trigonum. In most people, it fuses right here with this trigonal process of the talus. Clearly, it's not fused here, so it's a separate bone. Right over here you see the posteromedial process, part of the medial tubercle of the talus. Over here you see the posterolateral or trigonal process, part of the lateral tubercle. And then right here is the flexor hallucis longus tendon, situated between those two tubercles, and it's in very close proximity to the os trigonum. So, if somebody develops posterior impingement syndrome, also called os trigonum syndrome, there's a possibility that the irritation around the os trigonum and the associated inflammation and swelling can also cause damage to the flexor hallucis longus tendon. And it can cause it to not move as well, not glide as well through the sulcus right here. And that can lead to effects on mobility of the hallux. We'll see that in just a minute. So let's talk about this posterior impingement or os trigonum syndrome. Over here we see an x-ray. Here's the talus right here, the calcaneus below it. So this would be the subtalar joint right here. Above the talus we have the tibia and then the fibula, specifically the distal fibular head. And then this right here would be the talocrural joint or the ankle mortis. And then directly posterior to the talus we have this little ossicle, the os trigonum, less than one centimeter in diameter. So what can happen in os trigonum syndrome is the person gets pain with plantar flexion, and it's pain specifically kind of around here in front of the Achilles tendon, so where this os trigonum is, and it occurs during plantar flexion. And this is due to what we call the nutcracker effect. So if you consider the os trigonum the nut, and you undergo plantar flexion, especially end range plantar flexion, there's gonna be impingement of this os trigonum either between the talus and the calcaneus, or between the calcaneus and the end of the tibia right here, if it's enough plantar flexion. The whole point is this os trigonum gets impinged. That impingement causes irritation, inflammation, and swelling. And this swelling that occurs is going to be in the posterior ankle, but anterior to the Achilles tendon, right in the area of the impingement of the os trigonum. And as we talked about in the previous picture, Remember that the flexor hallucis longus tendon is situated very close to the os trigonum. And so if there's inflammation, swelling, and all sorts of inflammatory chemicals, that can cause irritation and damage to the flexor hallucis longus tendon. That can also impair the gliding of this tendon through the sulcus as the hallux is moving. And so that can result in rigidity of hallux movement, particularly with both flexion and extension. Okay. 
Now, due to all the swelling and inflammation back here in the posterior ankle around the Achilles tendon, this condition can often be mistaken for Achilles tendonitis. And it doesn't help things because both conditions often have pain with plantar flexion. So how do you differentiate the two? Well, in general, for most people, you're going to treat this as an Achilles tendonitis. And maybe it gets better. It can get better with conservative care. However, if it doesn't get better, you would send the person off for imaging and a definitive diagnosis of Ostrigonum syndrome, the person would have to have an Ostrigonum. If you send somebody to an x-ray and they don't have an Ostrigonum that's free-floating, it can't be Ostrigonum syndrome. To be that, they have to have the free-floating Ostrigonum. So they have to have an x-ray confirmation of the presence of this ossicle. Okay? Now, in terms of exercises and treatments, there's a medical approach and there is a physical therapy approach. The medical approach might begin with a cortisone injection. So the cortisone is a steroid, of course, and that's designed to get rid of the inflammation and the pain. This is very unlikely to be a long-term solution, and that's because it does nothing about addressing weaknesses, inflexibilities, or simply the presence of the ostrigonum. Okay? But the cortisone injection can give you a window of opportunity to do physical therapy. There's also the use of an immobilization boot. The immobilization boot basically just prevents subtalar movement and also talocural movement. And since plantar flexion is a talocural movement, immobilizing the talocural joint will prevent that impingement, maybe allow this to calm down to the point that the person will not need surgery or any other medical management. They might also tell the person to take NSAID medications, you know, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, and use ice for pain control, and sometimes they'll even use therapeutic ultrasound. Um, if the ostrigonum is fairly superficial, uh, meaning there's not a lot of swelling in the area and it's pretty close to the surface, you could probably get by with 3.3 megahertz. If the person has a thicker ankle, it's probably going to be better with 1 megahertz using about 1.2 watts per square centimeter and probably a 50% duty cycle. We definitely don't need 100% because there's already inflammation there. We actually want to use a non-thermal approach if we're doing therapeutic ultrasound. And that therapeutic ultrasound can sometimes be done in physical therapy. So that leads us to the physical therapy in which there are three stages. The first phase is the acute stage, zero to two weeks. And by the way, this is for non-operative management. So for modalities, oftentimes phonophoresis, iontophoresis, ultrasound as we just talked about, cold whirlpool, ice and ice massage, and e-stim are used for pain control. They'll often do soft tissue work and myofascial release around the triceps surrey and the plantar fascia. Mobilizations involving the talus, the calcaneus, the intertarsal joints, tibiofibular joints, and then working on flexibility, in particular with the triceps surrey, gastrocnemius and soleus, while the subtalar joint is in a neutral position. And then towards the end of the acute phase, they'll move more into strengthening exercises. So looking at strengthening the muscles about the talocural joint, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, strengthening the muscles of subtalar movement, those of inversion and eversion, eventually progressing to close kinetic chain exercises like the leg press, wall slides, using the multi-hip machine, and even strengthening the foot intrinsic muscles, and then also proprioceptive exercises, the BAPS board, single leg stance balance with the eyes open and eyes closed, and using the mini trampoline. Then we get to phase two, the subacute stage, between two and four weeks. And in general here, it's really just a continuation and progression of everything that we talked about in phase one, and then eventually with phase four, Three, it's a return to function over the last few weeks, four to six weeks. So getting into jumping progressions and progressive return to activities. Now, of course, if all of this fails, they'll probably do surgery. And in that surgery, they will remove the ostrigonum and potentially do a release of the flexor hallucis longus tendon if it is damaged to a significant extent so that the person can end up getting back uh, some additional hallux extension and flexion range of motion. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of Oz trigonum syndrome. In the next video, we're going to look at Oz peronian syndrome. See you then. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. 